Welcome to the Worst Wrestling Podcast. I am one-third of the three-man power trip. I am the one known as Brad, the elder statesman of the group. And I am joined here by my usual cohorts. I have uh, Damien. Introduce yourself, Damien. What's going on, everybody? Happy New Year. I am the younger statesman of the group. Uh Happy New Year to everybody. We haven't talked in a few weeks. It feels like it's been forever, and we're back to talking some pro wrestles. Yes. <laughs> and also, uh, we've got Justin here, who is the middle statesman, since I'm the old one of the group. Uh, Justin, put yourself over. How's everybody doing? Like, like Damien said, it's been a couple of weeks, but uh, those couple of weeks has been pleasant since I didn't have to see Damien's face in a couple of weeks, so oh, God, it's all good. Starting all <laughs> but but listen, guys, like we have obviously you see him on the screen. He is definitely the the voice of Ring Honor, man. This is someone that uh, that Brad has been been talking to. This is your man, Brad. So lean him in. Yes, uh, I am uh, very fortunate enough to have gotten to see this man, Ian Riccoboni, several times over. Uh, you know, every time you come to Stage AE in Pittsburgh, I'm right there, uh, usually yelling at you from the first or second row. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's it's a pleasure to talk to you, and uh, welcome to the Worst Wrestling Podcast. <laughs> Thank you. I, like I've always said, I only do the worst. I, I don't want right. to <laughs> ever do <laughs> don't ever do Sports <laughs> Illustrated or ESPN. But no, it's it's a pleasure to be here. And um, I'm from Eastern Pennsylvania. I'm from the East Side. I'm from Allentown. And so whenever we come to Pittsburgh, it's a lot of fun. I like love to go to Permanente Brothers. I love to go to the original Permanente Brothers, where the, where the Bruno San Martino mural is, which is really cool. Yeah. Uh, get your picture with it. Get the French fries on the sandwiches. And uh, yeah, it, Pittsburgh's always been a, a, an amazing place for us. And it's good to see you guys. Yeah. Wait, did, did, wait, did you say French fries on sandwiches? Oh, yeah. Permanente oh, yeah. Brothers. That's a that's a tradition. Yeah, you go there and they look at you weird. They look they they almost throw you out of the store if you don't get the French fries, specifically the original location. Um, mm -hmm. I've gone to one in York, Pennsylvania, which is closer to the middle of the state, and there's one right off the highway there. And you can you can do the hey, can you hold the French fries there? But you can't do it at the one with the Bruno mural you, in Pittsburgh. You just can't. I so the funny thing is. Ian, uh, you you went to the one that's five minutes from my house. I go. live in York, Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> I feel I feel like I'm like the fourth wheel of this group because I, I'm in Illinois, like I'm basically like the Chicago land area. So it's uh, I'm like, what fries on sandwiches? What is going on over there? <laughs> I like well, yeah. I mean, I think that's how we feel about your hot dogs. From you know, from the east coast, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. put, put the pickles on the tomatoes on the hot dogs, and we kind of look at, at y'all funny out there. So, or yins, yins funny. So, <laughs> I, yeah, I guess we all have right. our weird eating eating ways. That's for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so hold on, hold on. I have to ask since you are a Pennsylvania native, and me and Brad are also Pennsylvania natives. Please tell me that you're rooting for somebody here in the playoffs that are not the Pittsburgh Steelers, right? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready hey. for the Cleveland Browns. Full disclosure. Full stop. There it is. There it is. Oh. All right. Go Browns. Browns. It's over. Yeah. I tried to I tried to root for the I tried to root for the Bills. A couple fans online told me that I'd have to go through a table and I don't want to do that. <laughs> if if I got through three years with Bully Ray and no tables, I'm not risking it to be a Bills fan. So <laughs> we're we're going with the Browns. <laughs> That, oh, that that that's a good me. that's a good team. It's a good team. You know what? Listen, they they've done exceptionally well this season. Listen, these this weekend, playoff week, wild card weekend, it is going to be great. Like I cannot wait to get out of work, go home, sit on my butt for the next <laughs> legit day, two days to watch all the games. Personally, even though I'm a Cowboys fan, and and well, I mean, I know I see all the faces. I get it. I get it. But my listen, I'm just saying Super Bowl, it's probably going to be Kansas City and the Packers. That's where I'm going. Rematch of Super Bowl one. Yeah, I could see that. I, I think the NFC is a little more wide open than the AFC. I do think the AFC, I think the Chiefs are, are definitely in the driver's seat. But I'm rooting for the Browns. I love the underdog. I love guys like Cheeseburger. I love Dan Housen. 
I even kind of like Brian Johnson a little bit in Ring of Honor. So <laughs> I love love to root for the underdogs, and, and I'm hoping the Browns can can do some damage. Brad is like saying no to Cleo. Like, what's going on, Brad? Like, are you, <laughs> he's, like he's why are you so against Steelers. them? Right? <laughs> he's rooting well, for his my, Steelers. My brother or my my dad and my brother are huge Cleveland Browns fans. So I hear it constantly because uh, I grew up in Meadville, so it's closer to Cleveland than it is to Pittsburgh. So uh, I've had to hear about those stinking Browns all my life. So uh, oof, I'm done with them. I just want to see <laughs> a muscle, walk it dry, and then call it a day. So <laughs> That happens a lot in Allentown. Allentown, we're about 55 miles north of Philly, and we're about – 75 80 miles west of new york so i'm a big eagles fan but oh yes we we are <laughs> we are surrounded by new york fans because there's a lot of people that live here and commute there and it's not that far away if you travel early enough in the morning you can get there in about 90 minutes if you go at like 6 a.m 7 a.m so you know it's weird because there's a ton of eagles fans i'd say most of the eagles fans but there's some giants fans and some jets fans here too Ian can, can, is my new favorite commentator of all time. <laughs> can, I, can, I, can, I, can I just can I, can I just say that uh, between the the Cowboys, the Eagles, the the Washington uh, football team, and the Giants, we are just a complete and utter mess. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we make. Crazy. It's going to yeah. be crazy when Washington goes on to win the Super Bowl this year. <laughs> I'm, rooting, I'm rooting for him, you know. Alex Smith. Alex Smith, what a story. Yeah. What a it's, story. It's, it's just crazy. I mean, it, it, we, I mean, a high school varsity team, like, they look better than, than our team is put together. It's, it's, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a shame. <laughs> Well, uh, that, that's why we're the worst wrestling podcast. We started off with 15 minutes of football talk. So, <laughs> <laughs> Brad, why don't, you, uh, why don't you kick it off? Let's get some wrestling talk in, man. Yes, uh, let's, let's break into the world of wrestling. Uh, something that has struck me, this, this last year has been crazy, obviously, with everything going on in the world, the pandemic, uh, all of it. How has it been as a commentator? You see the performers out there wrestling, doing their thing, but to be in silence and have to call a match, uh, is it weird that they can potentially hear you, or how, how does that go for you? Yeah, I've asked a couple of guys that question, and it's interesting because they there's a group that says, we tune it out, we box it out, and then there's another group that says, we kind of feed off it because it's the only noise in the building. And so Caprice and I, we do live to tape commentary. So what you see on television isn't necessarily the full match. It's it's mm -hmm. taped and it's edited down to make sure that we can fit it onto TV. And you know, so what you're missing maybe is a minute or two of commercial break. And normally those matches, you know, for sake of editing and ease of editing, are just you take a minute out or you take a minute and a half out, and that's the commercial break. So what you're seeing is live to tape and we're calling it with as much energy and as emotion as we can muster with the exception of the Vegas, the recent Vegas episode where we showed some never before seen matches. Those were done in my basement and those were done. Um, if you listen to the commentary with the benefit of hindsight, where we talk about some of the things we did during the pandemic and that weekend in Vegas and things like that. But I, we've had wrestlers, you know, Rocky Romero and David Finley have said that it helped them during their match. Shane Taylor said the same thing. Uh, Jay Lethal said he just kind of goes into a tunnel vision and, and he doesn't notice really much noise anyway. Um, you know, he'll get inspired by the fans when they're there, but for the most part, he's just kind of focused on the match. So it's interesting to me that there is, a different, you know, essentially two ways to, to go about it if you're a wrestler. But from what we've heard, it's it's been helpful. And, and the biggest thing is, and I, I warned our producer this, I warned the wrestlers this, I'm calling it like it's like I call it if there were 10,000 people there or if there's no people there. So I'm going to get as into it as I normally do because this is my dream job. I've been looking forward to doing this since I've been about three years old. And I remember there's an exact moment, Jake the Snake Roberts, I think it's the May 1991 issue of WWF Magazine. It was the first one I ever got in the mail because I kept getting them at the grocery store and my mom said, well, why don't we just get it a subscription? It's cheaper. Instead of paying three bucks an issue, it's a dollar an issue, and, and you'll get all the magazines. So I remember it was the first one that came in the mail, and 
I asked my mom what, what this caption under Bobby Heenan said, and it said broadcast journalist. I said, well, what does that mean? And she, she said, well, that's just somebody that talks on TV about wrestling. And so for me, that's kind of the moment where I knew what I wanted to do. And from that moment, everything's just been kind of a process to, to get me there. So now that I'm in that seat, I'm going to bring it 100% whether there's, <laughs> there's zero people or whether it's Madison Square Garden and we had close to 20,000. Yeah, I was actually, now that you brought up like the, the no crowd, Brad, um, cause we all, we all always hear like ever since this pandemic started, like, you know, wrestlers are like, you know, we really feed off of the, the crowd, the energy, it, it really helps. So is it the same thing with, with commentating where like you hear the crowd and you, you see, you hear the excitement, like does it get you amped up? Like, how does it, now that you don't hear the crowd, like you said, I mean, I know you, you're going to give a hundred percent, but is it, is there something where it's just like, ah, it's not maybe as a hundred percent as you would like it to be? No, originally when I first started, the first matches I ever called were at the Monster Factory, and I think the very first match I ever called was Matt Riddle's first match, which okay. I'd have to go back and look. But I know I called this first match, and I think it was the opening match of a of a card, and I think it was the first time I ever called anything. And I remember when the crowd the crowd getting into something, I, I you do you can feed off of them, but once you do it. And if you go kind of on the scale that I did, where I started with 100 people, and then Monster Factory started to, to draw more people. So we got up to 200, 250, with Matt Riddle, with uh, Damian Priest, with Nick Camarado, with, with uh, Press 10 or, or 10 from, from mm -hmm. Dark Order, when all those guys were there, it, it would get progressively more exciting. But at the same time, that scale allowed me to just be more become more comfortable because by the first time I called a Ring of Honor match in Nashville in, in 2015 like live uh, I was I wasn't spooked by the crowd I wasn't spooked by a pop of the crowd I wasn't spooked by the extra energy uh, there's been some intimidating crowds all in uh, I was in the back the entire day so I walked in I saw the I saw the setup and then I went to the back and I was in the back for about seven hours and then I walked out, and X Pac and Scott Hall patted me on the back, introduced themselves, and wished me luck. That part was intimidating. And then seeing everybody in their seat, knowing my wife was there, knowing my son was there, that was intimidating. Uh, but once it gets to a certain point, it's just it's just wrestling, and that's sad and sobering. But the most fun part is to look back later that night or the next morning and say, "Wow, we did this!" Mm -hmm. <laughs> like. Wow, that was really cool. And I think that's an advice I'd give to any commentator coming up is it's okay to feed off the energy. It's okay to be nervous. It's okay to be uh, interested in your surroundings, but you have a job to do. And the the focus should be on the ring. So there's moments where, yes, like when the crowd, I, I remember distinctly in Columbus, there's a match with Jay Briscoe and Roderick Strong where my voice was going. I was losing energy. It was the third night in three days. It was an afternoon show, so it was even earlier. I didn't even get as much time to prepare or rest or whatnot. And the crowd got me back into that because it was a hell of a match, and the crowd was, was just rabid. But at the same time, and unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, gets to a point where you could kind of have tunnel vision and laser vision on the match and, and call it from there. And I think I'm naturally... I think I'm just naturally excited. I think I'm just naturally just an excited person. So that may vary from person to person, but I try and always keep my energy up. I, I drink uh, one uh, orange monster before I go out. <laughs> that might help too. And that keeps me energized before the matches. Good, good choice. <laughs> so I kind of have like a little bit of a two-parter because um, as both of these guys know, you obviously don't. This is the first time we've ever spoken. Um, I am a, uh, I was a wrestler here in York, um, and, and I did commentary and stuff like that when I wasn't wrestling or ring announcing or anything like that. So I have a little bit of a two-parter here for you. One, uh, you said you started at the Monster Factory. Was it ever hard for you to hear your own voice during a dead match? And then two... How do you get through a match, um, especially back then, not so much now, when you knew that that match just really was the drizzling shits? <laughs> so, yeah, I, there's a there's a big responsibility 
And I, and first of all, I thought when you said you're from New York and you wrestle, I thought you were going to mention something about the Red Scorpion, who's one of the. the I've, uh, re- I've wrestled. Uh, I've trained with him before. One of the one of the uncut gems of, of that area. Yes. But the uh, yeah, there, there's a responsibility as a commentator to make sure that you you present the wrestlers in the best light possible. And there's no incentive. There's no incentive to call out that the crowd isn't into it. There's no incentive to call right. out that the wrestlers um, maybe aren't at their best that day for whatever reason, whether it's menti- mentally, physically, just chemistry, what have you. And the ways you, you get through that is you accentuate their strengths and you know you can remind the crowd what's to come. And at the Monster Factory, we you know, you do see folks that to get better, you need experience and you need experience in front of a live crowd. Mm-hmm. And there are some people who, when I, that I named earlier, that when I saw their very first matches, I was like, okay, this, this might take a bit. And there are other people that I spoke about earlier who you see match one or, or match one to two and you're like, wow, okay, this is, they're going to be something special. Right. Yeah. And when you see folks like that to do commentary over it, you, you, remind the crowd what's real you remind the listener what's real this is their first match there and you frame it with strategy you know they can be inside their own head they might not be able to execute the move they wanted because this is their first match in front of a live crowd or their third match or we've only seen them twice and we we don't know much about them and this could be the, one of their earlier matches so adding that extra realism and framing it as a competition can really help you get through some of the matches of folks that that are trying to get that experience, that are working really, really hard to try and get through a match, and may not be getting the best results out of it. Got you. Uh, I guess kind of like a little bit of a follow up to that too, uh, for some of the the people that might be interested in commentary and wrestling, especially during this pandemic age, how would you suggest them building a demo reel or, or maybe getting themselves in front of a wrestling company to do commentary and stuff? It's a tricky time right now. And normally I would say, show up at your local independent, figure out who's in charge, figure out how you can help and just go help set up the ring, set up the chairs, um, start going to training, start doing what you can do to make yourself available and be of value go on their YouTube page, find matches that don't have commentary, put commentary over it, offer it up to them and say, hey, I'd really like to do this. Here's some things I, I, I've tried to do. Um, let me know if, if we can, if, you know, if you'd like me to send more. That's what I would do in the non-pandemic age. In the pandemic age, it's significantly tougher. Um, you know, any given time at Ring of Honor, we would have 30 to 40 independent wrestlers show up and, and try and do that same thing and try and offer their assistance in setting mm-hmm. up the rank, setting up the chairs, helping with the venue, uh, essentially looking, you know, let's call it what it is for an opportunity later in the night in the dark match and right. you know, for the non-televised match. And so that process had kind of been standardized. Right now, though, the best thing I can, I can tell anybody is if you're looking to do something now, it's probably too late because it's now almost 12 months into the pandemic. That's 10 months you could have been doing commentary over these matches, of trying to get better, of listening to yourself, of hearing yourself. You are the best critic of yourself. And I know Jim Ross actually has trouble listening to, he's, he said on his podcast, and I'll never forget this, he has trouble listening to himself call matches back. And we all have that instinct. But for me, when the spidey sense goes off, when I'm listening to myself and I hear something I don't like, that's when I know I got to change it, whether I'm hemming and hawing too much, whether I was too fast, whether I was at a 10 the whole night where I should have been at a four and an eight and a six. That's the best instant feedback you can get. So right now, during the pandemic, if you haven't started, someone probably already has and someone's trying to beat you to that <laughs> spot. But it's not too late to, you know, to put your, you know, to try and get the reps ahead of when things start to open back up with the vaccines. Um, What my suggestion is, is the same that I just had now, is find matches that don't have commentary, do commentary, listen to them back. Don't stop the tape. Let the tape run. Let yourself work through failure. Let yourself work through ums and hums and, and, you know, the the filler words and things like that. Go back and listen. Listen for the filler words. Listen for the hums, hums, ahs. And then do it again and just keep doing that. And 
that is one way that is absolutely free that can make anybody a better commentator without any feedback because you will know right away at least at a basic level by listening to yourself what you personally don't like about that and if you don't like something about that chances are you'll get the same feedback from somebody else so at the very base at the very baseline you can start to correct some of your mistakes and build up you know build yourself up from there there are companies that are that are chomping at the bit to get going again in pennsylvania the, the restrictions are a little bit tighter in new jersey they're a little bit looser um so there are companies that are starting to run smaller events and honestly you know i would seek those out i'd look for companies that post their matches on twitter and instagram live and, and igtv and look for the companies that don't have commentary and do the same thing record yourself calling the match calling the highlight clips and sending it to them and to be real, I'd pick a five to eight minute match because that's about all that that I, I think we have the attention span for <laughs> to uh, you know, for, for critiquing purposes, right? You right. Know, the you know the main events at Wrestle Kingdom are wonderful, and I think we can all sit and enjoy those for forty five minutes. But in the interest of helping somebody, five to eight minutes is usually a good range to to provide some feedback on that. Love it. Nice. So I actually, you brought up Jim Ross and you brought up Madison Square Garden. Um, so Ring of Honor, uh, you know, headlines Madison Square Garden, like the first wrestling company since the WWE to do it. Like I think since like 1960. Mm-hmm. Like you and you, we all grew up on Jim Ross's voice and we heard him, you know, talk about the the magic of Madison Square Garden. Like how was it? for you kind of like growing up and hearing Jim Ross talk about Madison Square Garden, like how was it to, to commentate in, you know, the Mecca of, of wrestling arenas? Yeah. Even beyond Jim Ross, I think to Bruce Springsteen, uh, my favorite musician, favorite artist. I think to Billy Joel was a residency there. I think of the John Lennon concerts, Elton John. I think all the historic events, I think about Bruno in the garden. Uh, Bob Backlund defending the title against everybody from from Buddy Rose, uh, then to the Iron Sheik, and then Hogan beating the Sheik, the Iron Sheik there for the title. Uh, there's just there's so many so many huge events that have happened in Madison Square Garden, and when this when Frank Sinatra's New York, New York says if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. I think that's true, and I think there's a lot of people that doubted Ring of Honor and the resilience of Ring of Honor we were counted out by a lot of people and mm-hmm. instead of taking names instead of curling up we did our best to reload that same year we signed bandito mark haskins we signed a number of international talent that are still here they're still with us we picked up roosh our, our world champion we picked up his brother dragon lee some of the very top top of the top wrestlers in the world and madison square garden for us was an opportunity to kind of put our flag down and it was a celebra- celebratory moment for us. We knew there was a, a long road ahead because of the timing, because of AEW about to launch, because of the, the nine, I think it's nine or 10 wrestlers that left Ring of Honor to start AEW. We knew that there was gonna be some challenges ahead, but that was a moment to celebrate and enjoy it. Uh, we loved doing it with our partners at New Japan. I got to do it with my mentor, Kevin Kelly. Yeah. And <laughs> that that's kind of something. I mean, it's like going out fishing with your dad and you know it's one of these things that kevin put so much time into me reviewing those five to eight minute matches listening to to dark matches where there wasn't much reaction because it was two wrestlers that ring of honor fans didn't know about that i'll have you know most of which of those dark matches between 2015 and and 2017 that i called uh, most of those wrestlers are in WWE, AEW, Ring of Honor, mm-hmm. and right now. <laughs> so yep. Yep. So pay attention to those because you never know who you're going to see. Um, but yeah, it's just, in, you know, it was incredible. And then to, to do it with Colt, who had been my partner for so long. And then Caprice as well. Caprice, who's become my partner, uh, was in a number of those matches as well. And it was just a really celebratory experience. I got goosebumps riding up on the on the VIP elevator with the big Madison Square Garden logos all over the place. We were in the New York Rangers locker room. We were in the, you know, you walk through the corridor, there's Jimi Hendrix, there's Paul McCartney, there's Bruce Springsteen, there's Elton John. And suddenly you realize you're a part of a group that's done something that WCW didn't do, that the AWA didn't do, that ECW didn't do, and that no one has done yet. And so I think it speaks a lot to New Japan and Ring of Honor to be able to put on an event like that 
and and really just have it be a knockdown drag out success sold out in I think under an hour uh, in the summer of 2018 and you know, just a super hot ticket and you know there's guys for me I think of Kerry Silken who scout tickets and hustle tickets outside of Madison Square Garden for almost 10 years and, and now has turned that into a more legitimate business. Right. I think the Beer City <laughs> Bruiser uh, who just fought and tooth and nail to mm-hmm. start a career in wrestling and then he, he finally gets to a nationally televised company after about 15 years and then five years later he gets to wrestle in the garden. Same thing with Brian Malonis. Um, same thing with Rhett Titus, who's been with Ring of Honor since he's been a literal teenager. And for him to be able to get in the middle of the ring in the world's most famous arena and hit that sweet double bicep pose in the ring with Minoru Suzuki, <laughs> in the ring with Jushin Liger, it's like, whoa, you're seeing all of your friends living their dream and being right there with them living your dream. It was it was insane. That's awesome. That's so, awesome. I know. I know, Brad. Brad, I know you had a when we were texting. You had a, a good uh, uh, kind of question you wanted to ask them. Yeah, uh, Ring of Honor is in one of those positions where the talent uh, they come in really young, and unfortunately, they end up leaving sort of young and moving on to whether it's AEW, WWE, anywhere else. Uh, you know. Tell me a little bit about how is that learning all these new talent constantly? It's like a rotating cast. Uh, sure. You know, it has to be tough to keep up on. Yeah. In 2019, I had a sense of that happening. So I kept a list of every wrestler that I called a match for for the first time. The list came out to 92. Holy oh, wow. cow. 92 wrestlers just that year that I hadn't called ever before. So that doesn't include Jay Lethal, Jonathan Gresham, Rhett Titus, Tracy Williams. That was just new wrestlers that I just had called for the very first time. That list was kind of neat. It included Dan Housen. It included, uh, geez, who else? Uh, Tony Kojima. Devin, right? It included Yuji Nagata. It included the Rock and Roll Express. But it also included maybe 15 or 20 guys that haven't broken through yet, that had one or two opportunities here and there, that haven't gone all the way and, and just haven't secured the contract yet with a major company. For me... That's really exciting. I was a, this is going to take a really strange turn. I was a bat boy for the Allentown Ambassadors of the Northeastern League mm-hmm. and the Northern League, which is an independent baseball organization, yep. not affiliated with any, any teams, um, from 99 to 2000. And we would see guys come in, and it would be the most exciting day in the world when they were named an all star in the Northern League, and then two weeks later, they got a minor league contract somewhere. Mm-hmm. And For me, that was super cool to see as a kid. Now, you know, Ring of Honor, you mentioned that we do have the younger guys coming in. The the traditional trajectory was that you would see them come in for two, three years and and head out the door. Tyler Black, Nigel McGinnis. um, You know, Brian Danielson was there for a little bit longer, but I think he he fits the same mold based on how just how young he was when he started. I think he was only 27 when he left Ring of Honor at 28. But now we've had Jay Lethal since 2012. We've had the Briscoes uh, back full time since 2005, um, and they're only in their mid 30s. Jonathan Gresham, early 30s. We've had him now for five years. Uh, Bandito, this is his third year already, and he's only 24. Uh, Dragon Lee's 24. Um, you know, I think Ring of Honor has proved by a number of things, whether it be the Garden, whether it be financially. I can tell you, you know. I, don't mean to be to, to brag or what have you, but our paychecks have gotten bigger as the years have gone on. And I think there's a real incentive now for Ring of Honor to keep talent under contract and make competitive offers with, with the bigger organizations. And we've had success with that in some regards. Now, it's always good for a change of scenery. You know, we have EC3 coming in who has been a champion everywhere he went. And he is a bona fide box office attraction for, mm-hmm. for us and for any organization. And he could have stayed with the WWE. He could have stayed with Impact. He probably could have gone to AEW. But there are reasons folks will come to Ring of Honor. Beyond money, there's the camaraderie. There's the the focus. We're consistent. Um, We keep the wrestlers safe in terms of the COVID testing, wrestlers and staff. And so, you know, over the years, that has been the pattern. But I'll say there's been a concerted effort to, to keep younger wrestlers in. That said, it's really fun to call somebody's match and see them get an opportunity. I think Myron Reed, I called a Myron Reed match four years ago. Mm-hmm. 
And he was, you could tell he was going to be really, really good. He wasn't the same wrestler then as he is now. So at the end of the day, it was, hey, great, keep showing your face. And if something opens up, get a little more experience and come back. But he has a great opportunity with MLW now. So there's different things that happen where we'll see a lot of guys where it might not be, it's either the right time, like we struck, the iron was hot with Mark Haskins, with Bandito, with Dragon Lee. And sometimes it, you just need a little bit more experience. And I don't think it's anybody's sweat off Andy's back, anybody's back if somebody does get a great chance somewhere else. Maybe we're just a, a half step late on someone. So, you know, it, as we've grown, we've seen that kind of shift where Ring of Honor has become a destination. And all you have to do is look back to, to when Cody came in or when Billy Ray came in or when, you know, Adam Cole stayed. Uh, at one point, he had an opportunity to go to WWE before he did and he decided to stay. And, and there's a couple opportunities there for guys to leave where they said, oh, not, not yet, not yet. This is a good place for me to be. And uh, it's it's been good for us. Yeah, it's it's really like uh, obviously when you talk of the world of pro wrestling, it's always you know WWF, WWE, WCW, all those big names. But like when you look at it, because you know there's you know those those guys. But when you look at like the history, like Ring of Honor has so much like lineage of like of these current wrestlers that they put on like the best matches while they're in Ring of Honor. You know, your Adam Coles, your your uh, Brian Danielsons. You, I mean, Nigel was so great when he was in there. It was it was unbelievable. The Samoa Joes, CM Punk's. Yeah. It's just like people like shouldn't be stuck in such of a bubble of these top wrestling brands and kind of like go and and go out that bubble and and research. You know, the Ring of Honors, the New Japan's, you know, the All Japan's, like all those wrestling companies. Are great, but just because they're not on a you know a big time USA Network or TNT, you know it's just kind of like you know whatever. Forget them. But you guys put on great shows. Like it's it's great. Like every, anything, everything is great. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It's, it it can be frustrating sometimes. I'll admit. Uh, I feel you could stack our wrestling against anybody else's, mm -hmm. specifically the pure tournament. I feel that if you took our program. From so top good. to bottom, we have the best one hour on television. And it's it's easy to watch. You understand it. You understand why the wrestlers are wrestling. You understand the stakes of what they're wrestling for. And that's it. I mean, to me, that's that might be, you know, oversimplified. But that's what I would personally want from wrestling. And I feel like we deliver. And I think there's a lot of fans that, if they gave us a shot, they would see that you know, Ring of Honor does have a very, very easy to watch one hour television program that you understand why everybody's wrestling and hopefully Caprice and I can help you understand what's going on in the ring. Uh, I think it's been that way for a while and there, there are legitimate reasons why people feel the way they do sometimes about Ring of Honor or AEW or Impact or, or even WWE. But I like that we're a part of the, the wrestling ecosystem. And what has been really, really interesting to me, I've personally benefited from it, my colleagues have, whether they've stayed or gone on to different organizations, is the more eyes that are on wrestling and the more eyes that are on different companies, it opens up different opportunities, mm -hmm. whether that's financial, whether that is creative, artistic, it, the sky's the limit. And to see AEW come up, you know, there's a part of us that I think we're, we're heartbroken because we were on a little bit of a roll with, with ROH. Then there's a, the other piece that is, well, rising tides lift all ships. And if there's somebody else that comes along that can take nine folks that were really part of Ring of Honor's DNA for the last two or three years and start up a company, you know, if that tide rises for everyone, we will be in better shape too. And that's given opportunities for folks in our company. It's given opportunities for folks in other companies to come to us. And so anytime that ecosystem can grow, and have viable television products. And right now, there, there's at least four that I can think of off the top of my head. And that doesn't even include New Japan, who's about to announce a, a deal also again to, mm -hmm. to come back to TV. So there's going to be five soon. And then there's going to be your CMLLs, where we've seen American talent go and, get, and create a bigger name for themselves. Then there's the MLWs that are kind of right on the cusp that can create some compelling television. So for me, just seeing that ecosystem grow is, is a good thing. And I think, again, 
the more viable options there are, the rising tide will lift all ships. Do I ever think it'll be the Attitude Era again where everybody's wearing a wrestling t-shirt? That's going to be tough to do. You're going to need a, a, a major compelling star or story to do that. But if there's three million people on a regular basis watching some form of wrestling, that's a big win for wrestling. And that opens up a lot for a lot of the wrestlers and, and staff. So oh, I was sure. I was actually about to say, um, I, and, and you and I being a little bit closer to the inside baseball of wrestling than most people, and, and even us doing the podcast and everything, I, I, I always say that we are on the verge of a wrestling boom again, but I don't think it's going to be to the extent of the Attitude Era where everybody is watching one or two programs. I think everybody is about to start booming together. And it's going to be almost like you see in Japanese core audiences where you have your Ring of Honor staples, you have your AEW staples, your Impact staples, and your WWE staples. Because over there, they're more dedicated to one brand than they are just all of wrestling. And I feel like that's about to be where the world of wrestling here in America is going to be as well. And I think it's going to really lift up here within the next five years to be something really special and we're going to see a lot more indie promotions taking off and we're going to see a lot more nationally televised tv do you agree it, it'll be close um i honestly there's there's a fine line between oversaturation and mm -hmm. and and viable companies so the i don't know what that magic formula is there's attention is able to be drawn in so many different directions whether it is youtube now or twitch or uh instagram tv or snapchat or TikTok or uh you name it there's so many different viable options one of the best things wwe did though was they they became the coca-cola of wrestling and mm -hmm. that may have hurt a, a few aspects uh, of wrestling that that people really enjoyed in the 70s and 80s in a major way but it made wrestling kind of acceptable. They are a brand now. There's somebody that Fox has on television. And so that if you tell your if you tell your parents, if you're 15 years old, hey, I want to go get a ticket to this wrestling show, Ring of Honor. Oh, is that one of those UFC things? No, no, it's like WWE. That's a lot easier for a 15-year-old to sell their parent. Um, okay, what time do I need to drop you off? What time do I need to pick you up? Who are you going with, et cetera? Um, you know, or, you know, a 21-year-old that just meets a girl for the first time. Oh, what are you watching? Oh, that's, uh, that's Ring of Honor. Oh, is that like UFC? Oh, it's WWE. Um, <laughs> you know, those, it, it's kind of just part of the fabric now. And I do think that that, it's taken away some of the magic, but it's added some of the bonuses of being able to talk about wrestling and, and bringing that out into the open. Whereas before, if you were a wrestling fan and it wasn't 1998 through 2000, you didn't talk about it too much mm -hmm. coming from somebody that had all the t-shirts and continued to wear them before and after the, the wrestling booms. Um, yeah, I, I, we could be. We could be. It's going to take, in order for it to boom like that, it's going to take something significant to happen. Uh, whether that is a major star or a major, a major story or something that develops um, mm -hmm. out of somewhere that it, it's it would need some help to boom but it's got it was to a point where independent organizations were drawing really well um independent organizations usually run on a loss i i think some fans were surprised to hear that yeah. uh, but they were beginning to be in the black they you know yeah. even if it was just a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars um you know i i say that knowing a few independent promoters that do it for the love of the game not necessarily <laughs> they have any money yeah. um you know, it's that, that was starting to happen in 18 and 19 uh, before the pandemic. And I think we could get there soon. Um, I think it's going to be a thing where it's going to inadvertently mirror a lot of the wrestling landscape in the 60s and 70s where you had kind of a, a big deal promotion in each part of the country. And we're right. starting to get there again, too, whether it was AIW, whether it was FIP down in Florida. Uh, whether it was Beyond or Monster Factory, whoever in the Northeast, you know, take your pick. And we, that <laughs> system was starting to build. So, you know, if we if we come out of this pandemic, I think the ecosystem could be um, could be refreshed a little bit. Um, what's interesting, what's going to be interesting to me is it's a kind of a lost year, and it's not necessarily a lost year for people that were already in wrestling, 
It was a lost year to continue to refill the talent. Yes. Um, what AEW has been able to do that I really admire is get folks like 10, um, Preston Vance, on the screen. Uh, and he's a guy who's only three or four years in. Um, they've been able to get Alan Angels on the screen who's only two or three years in. They, these are guys that we saw at Ring of Honor camps that we knew had potential, but we didn't have the secondary show or secondary outlet to get them the reps. Um, what happens when you know, a star from WWE or NXT goes to Impact or goes to Ring of Honor or goes to AEW a year or two from now, where is that group that should have been starting training in 2020? Where is that group? And that's kind of what I'm worried about. It, you know, where's the future beyond the, the guys and gals we're starting to see on Future of Honor, beyond the guys and gals we're starting to see on AEW Dark, but beyond who we're already seeing? Like, is yeah. there a group that started in 2020 that two or three years from now will start to fill those spots. So I'm cautiously optimistic that there is kind of a, a nice rising tide where wrestling is kind of acceptable. Everybody kind of watches a little bit of everything. But I'm worried that there is a year, this kind of wasted year, for folks that might be interested in, in starting to wrestle, what that looks like two or three years from now. Great answer. <laughs> <laughs> Great answer. I loved it. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so I know, uh, Brad, you enjoy the combination of, of Ian and Colt Cabana's commentary. And yes, I was a huge fan of that. And you'll be able to hear them if you play video games. Uh, you, Ian, are going to be the uh, the main voice for uh, Retro Sauce, um, Re Re Retro Mania. Mm -hmm. going to be coming out shortly. How did? How is that? Like, I mean. All I'm saying is, growing up, going to Aladdin's Castle at my local mall, playing WrestleFest was like, it was, it was like Christmas every time I was there. So knowing that this game's gonna be coming out, like I am stoked, like I am ready for it. Like, how is it for you, like, to be a part of like legit, like it's it's like for for gamers and people that loved it, it's like history. Like, how does it feel to be a part of that? It's crazy. I remember. When we first moved into our house in Allentown, I was three years old, and it was before we got, there was a period where we didn't have appliances, at least a washer or dryer. And so we go to the laundromat, and at the laundromat, they had WrestleFest. And that was my favorite part. I begged my mom to take us to the laundromat so that <laughs> we could play, play WrestleFest. And I was always, always, always demolition, always. And I never got to the Legion of Doom because I was three years old. But I used to like the bang on the buttons. I like the graphics. I like all that. I don't know that I ever want to match. I only got a quarter at a time. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I have such fond memories of that. And then later, um, in the mid-90s, late 90s, there were still some arcades around here. They had re they had uh, WrestleFest. They had the original WrestleMania, its predecessor. Um, you know, with, with Andre the Giant, with Honky Tonk Man, with uh, Randy Savage, and so on. So that, for me, was a thrill. I I got a message from Colt, and Colt had said, can I give him your number? And a, a first message didn't go through or something. He just said, can I give him your number? And I said, yeah, who? And he goes, oh, uh, you didn't get my message? No. And he said, well, this guy, this guy Mike from, uh, from Retrosoft wants to do a video game, and he wants to have us as the commentary. I said, okay, cool. And then... I reached out to uh, our office and said, hey, they'd like me to be a part of this video game. I'd really like to do it. They're offering me their generous money to do it. Uh, may I do it? And they said, yeah, as long as you're not advertised as Ring of Honor's Ian Riccoboni, if they'd like to make a Ring of Honor game, they can they can do that. But as long as you're just Ian Riccoboni, go ahead. Great. You know, it's wonderful. You're making some extra money. Let us know if you need anything, et cetera. So that was the only stipulation to do it. Um, I got with Mike that day. Um, I had a, a script the day after. I did the lines that night. I had a check three days later. And I've been doing a couple couple lines here and there as they add wrestlers. Um, I've, you know, I've added stuff for Warhorse. I've added stuff for Chris Bay. I've added stuff for uh, Brian Myers and Matt Cardona. And so this game will be pretty up to date when it's released. I've already agreed to do updated stuff for any new wrestlers that get added because they're promising some robust DLC. If the interest nice. is there, so Wonderful. yeah, it's it's a really great project. They're doing it right. They're taking their time. I know some people are disappointed by the delay, but 
I don't know if you've seen the latest build of it. It looks amazing. It looks, it looks and awesome. feels just like just like uh, WrestleFest. So I'm super excited. I can't believe it. Um, they sent me the render. They sent me a really cool picture that I can't even talk about because it's part of the the championship series. So Ooh. I know <laughs> I, I've been sworn. To I thought we were about to break some news. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, you know, the first game had Mean Gene in it. I'll just say that there's a, a very famous scene with Mean Gene and two wrestlers that are at Re- WrestleFest that are also in Retromania that I replaced mm. Mean Gene. So that oh, kind of, boy. So that's pretty cool for me. Uh, it's just like living, you know, living a dream. And I never thought I'd be in a video game. I, I knew Ring of Honor had the potential to do great things. I knew that, you know... I never expected Madison Square Garden, but it didn't surprise me in a weird kind of way. Um, I never expected to go to Wales or go to England multiple times or go, you know, even just to Canada multiple times. Um, but it didn't surprise me. The video game surprised me. <laughs> the video game is something <laughs> that, like, wait a minute, I'm, you're, you're paying me to do this so that you can put me in this game. Um, it was unreal. That's awesome. I got goosebumps for you when you were saying that. I'm like, oh. <laughs> That's awesome. It's, it's so cool. Like, you, you, you see this, the little clips that they have that they release on, on social media, and you hear, you know, your, your voice, Colt's voice, and, and it's just like, oh, like, I can't wait. And you know what? Like, to everybody that's been, like, hating on them for, for taking for so long to get it out, I don't care. Like, Mike no. has literally said that he wants to release it when it's perfect, and th- if it takes two more months, three more months, six more months, that's absolutely fine because we've all been waiting for it. And once we get it, I know we're all going to be 100% satisfied. So take as long as you want, Mike. Absolutely. Yeah, see, we don't we don't need a repeat of 2K20. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or or any yeah, 2K21. Was that. Yeah, that too. <laughs> the, the shot mechanics were broke when they released it. So It was so bad. But yeah, I, I'm I'm excited for it. I'm I'm super excited. I was always I was always keeping track of it on the socials and stuff, and and just seeing everything come together. It, it's it, oh, it looks beautiful. <laughs> Brad, over to you. If you have anything else, yeah. So uh, Ring of Honor has a lot of young talent. It's it's a place where a lot of young talent really come in. They cut their teeth for the first time on a like national stage. Uh, who are some of the younger talent that you think we should all keep an eye out on? Mm-hmm. First name's going to surprise you because he's been there forever, but and and people don't think of him as young, but he's got many years left. Rhett Titus, I think 20, 2021 is going to be Rhett Titus's year, and I know that's not a sexy pick. I know that's not a name that that people want to hear, but this is the year of Rhett Titus, and I'm I'm going to call that right now. Um, and number two, again, it's a name that's been around for a minute, but we haven't seen him in the main event. I think we're going to see him there a lot. Bandito. Bandito is a guy that just re-signed. Uh, A-list, you know, A-plus, top-of-the-tier guy that I think will compete for the Ring of Honor World Championship. I think he's only 24. He might be 25. Uh, so you'll see, I think, I'm hoping we'll see a lot more of him. Um, and then a name that I really like, he's a Pennsylvanian. I'm a little biased. He's announced from Hershey, but I know he's from Shimokin. And once you're from Shimokin, you're always from Shimokin. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's Tony Deppin. Yes. Uh, I'm hoping yes. Ring of Honor makes a play for Tony Deppin long term. And I think if they do, you know, we'll see him, I, him and LSG, uh, guys of that ilk who are just really, really good wrestlers and who are younger wrestlers getting that taste and getting to fight and claw. LSG is not maybe a guy you think of as necessarily young because he's been around in a tag team. But I think, much like Red Titus, I think this is the year he steps out and he breaks out too. So I give you a lot of names, <laughs> but um, yeah. I think in the singles division, Red Titus, this could be the year. Bandito, I think you'll see in the main events. Tony Deppin, if he's committed long term. LSG, because he's finally a single wrestler. And I'll pick SOS in the tag team division. Okay. Nice. Yeah, I... I have to say that the Tony Devin, when I was waiting for you to say his name, I've I've shared quite a few locker rooms with him down here in York. Um, he's he's friends with the Booker that I, I used to I used to run with and everything, and he is such an amazing talent, more than like 
I don't know if it's really a thing yet, but an American strong style like that, like him, Jonathan Gresham, like all the guys in that pure tournament kind of created their own style now of American strong style, where it, it combines the Brit res and the new and the Japanese strong style together for like a lot of Japanese junior stuff too. Like it, it's just this amalgamation of different styles that they all blend so well and. Oh, I was so glad he said his name. I, I'm super <laughs> proud of that guy. I'll, I'll tell you what I like in five seconds about Tony Deppin. There's only one Tony Deppin. Yes. There's there's things he does. You'll, you'll go to wrestling school, um, and you'll learn one way to do things. There are natural movements your body wants to do that differ from that. Sometimes it's best to do the homogenized way because it is safer for yourself and others. Most of the time that is the case. Other times, you should lean into the different ways you do things. The way Tony Deppin throws slaps, the way he kind of, he's kind of a duck walk, um, yeah. reminds me a lot of Bob Backlund. Just in yes. that he moved. There's only one person that moves like Tony Deppin, and he's very easy to say that is Tony Deppin. You can tell by the way he walks, by the way he moves. And so, to me, that's a story in and of itself. When you can you can define who you are just by the way you move. But <laughs> that's. <laughs> I just I think, said five seconds. I think I did twenty. So. I think the, the closest person that you can compare to Tony Depp in, and just the uniqueness of itself is someone like a low key, where you see low key move, you know that's low key, and it's similar with Depp in the way Depp in moves, you know it's Depp in. Like, and it, he's just so good. So yeah, I'm glad that we could gush about a PA native for a couple minutes. <laughs> So, so we we've uh, we we definitely hit all aspects of wrestling and stuff, which I obviously this is a wrestling podcast, so we enjoy. But I personally just like to know the individual that we're talking to. So I just I come up with some random questions that uh, some people just kind of be like, huh? Because I know the last time we asked some questions for Sam Adonis, he was like, what is these? What are these questions? <laughs> so, uh, so. We are going. I'm gonna ask you five questions, and then you are going to uh, give us your 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 best response, Ian. Got it. All right. So, if you could compare yourself with any animal, which would it be, and why? A penguin. Um, penguins are are good parents. They are adaptable. They are very loyal to their family. Um, they're smart. And they are shaped like me. I'm kind of pear shaped, and I wear. I'm lucky that I get to wear a suit because my upper body and my face uh, always kind of stay the same, but my gut and my hips can they can fluctuate. <laughs> so, and, I, and, and they always kind of look like they have a suit on. So I'll, I'll say a penguin. Nice, Love but it. I mean, you got that badass haircut too, though. So I, I, yes, God, yeah, so. I love the hair. I love well, the emperor penguins hair. have the crest. They have the kind of the crest like that. There you so. go. Are you going emperor for a full penguin. fledged mullet? Like I have to ask. Are you going for the full mullet? At this point, I mean, it's been six months, so I guess. Like I get. I mean, it's kind of almost there. It's, <laughs> it's like my shoulders now. So. <laughs> God, bring in Billy Ray Cyrus. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> love it. That's awesome. Um, all right, next one. What was the last gift you gave someone? Ooh, uh, last gift I gave somebody. I I gave my wife a chess set. She's been really into chess. She watched the show on Netflix. Uh, I gave got my wife a chess set, and I got her uh, the um, the thing where you can find your keys tile. So oh. <laughs> just, with kids, you, you lose your mind a little bit, and I catch myself losing stuff, and she does as well. So uh, we got the tile system. <laughs> awesome. Um, what keeps you up at night? The threat of the universe growing faster than the speed of light. I don't know where it's going. I don't want to think about it. Is what's it growing into? If it's growing into something, it means we are encapsulated by something and it's a men in black situation. And my mind can't handle that. So I <laughs> so <laughs> faster than the speed of light. Love it. It's great. Um, what's your favorite word? Favorite word. Um it can be a swear word, by the way. We are explicit. <laughs> Probably coccyx. Um, I've said the word coccyx a couple of times on Ring of Honor, 
and people thought I said just the first part. And, <laughs> and the coccyx is the little bone, your tailbone, mm -hmm. and you it's come into play in a couple matches. People miss leg drops, people miss different moves, or the atomic drop, you get dropped on your coccyx. And so I really like using coccyx. I have, um, I have some experience in uh, pharmaceutical reimbursement, medical billing and coding. So I, I don't have a biology background, but I will pull out from time to time different body parts that uh, usually have a more common name. I sometimes I have a bad habit of saying they're less common name. <laughs> so <laughs> is the one for me. You know, you know, like side note, like I, I love you. Know, obviously, like growing up, you listen to like Mike Tanay, and he would be so detailed. Like if there was any body part that was someone was working on, he he gave you like the medical term for that name, and you I miss that nowadays. Like it's not as dominant as it used to. I mean, I Gorilla Monsoon, I would think he, I thought he just made up the <laughs> these names, <laughs> you know. But it's like it's crazy. He'd make up. He'd legit make up wrestling move names, but he, all of his anatomy is on point. All of his anatomy. Is on <laughs> some, of, some of the move names he would just attribute to, to countries that didn't even exist. You know, he'd take such and such arm drag and it didn't exist. But uh, his anatomy, from what I can tell, has been on point from, from my listening over the years. <laughs> well, it, it, it's definitely better than, than listening to uh, to Vince being like, oh, that's a great move. Or, oh, what a maneuver. <laughs> yeah, what a maneuver. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> it's like, Oh boy, Vince. Oh boy. <laughs> oh, but nobody had the energy he did, and that's it's oh. interesting. You, you get you get six of one, half a dozen of the other, and uh, for what he lacked in in moves, he he brought the energy, and make it he made you excited to watch. <laughs> well, and then that's when you bring both together, and you get Ian Riccoboni. Oh, <laughs> oh thank you. There you go. <laughs> so, last question: How many days in a row do you wear the same pants before it becomes a problem? Ooh, I think it, it, it differs between jeans and athletic wear for me. Jeans, about a week. I'll mm -hmm. take off a pair of jeans. I'll fold them up or roll them up, throw them next to my bed or throw them in the drawer, pull them out the next day. Uh, if it's athletic stuff, if it's shorts and I'm going for a run or if I'm working out, uh, same day. Like You got to... You got to wash those because you got stuff sweating off you, rolling down into places, and you got to make sure you wash those. But jeans, jeans, you know, unless you get a, unless the kids throw some food on them, unless something happens, you, you can get about a week or two out of those. Absolutely. Good. <laughs> Good. Well, and man, this has been this has been awesome. It's been a pleasure. pleasure. Um, you know, obviously, Brad. Uh, you know, thank you for for reaching out to Ian and and you guys. You know, coming together to make this happen. Um, but uh, let us know your your uh, your handles, your social media handles, so we can all uh, be in contact with you. Yeah, everything is at Ian Riccoboni. So uh, I A N R I C C A B O N I. Um, Carrie Silk and I do a podcast every week called Last Stop Penn Station, where we talk about everything from his time running Ring of Honor to his exploits in New York City in the 70s and 80s involving sex, drugs, rock and roll, you name it. Um, we've been doing a series called 55 and 5 on YouTube, where we go through each card of the 1955 Parkhurst wrestling set. Uh, there's some <laughs> names that you'll know like Buddy Rogers and Luthez. There's some names you won't know, like Steve McGill, who somehow got in the set and from what we could tell, only wrestled about 100 matches total. So it's a really cool set. We do little history lessons. They're intended to be five minutes. Uh, that's 55 and 5. You can get right to the YouTube playlist at 55and5.com and that'll take you right there. And, and we're up to 20 episodes and, and rolling. We're going to do all 121. <laughs> so, oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Dang. Love it. That is awesome. Well, Ian, uh, thank you very much again. Um, it, you know, good luck to you and, and, and your future within the company. And obviously, Ring of Honor just needs to keep pumping that, that, that good stuff out because it is it's great. It's great, you know, work that, that you guys do. So much, Absolutely. much I appreciate, you know, to you. Uh, and thank you so much for having me, everybody. <laughs> All right. Well, then we'll, 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 soon, hopefully. we'll talk to you soon, Ian. <laughs> All right, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.